Artificial intelligence is already reshaping our lives, the way we drive or fight wars, or even how we develop vaccines. And there's a lot more to come. Kai-Fu Lee has been at the center of AI development for decades, with stints as an executive at Apple, Microsoft, and Google. He's now the CEO of Sinovation Ventures, a venture capital firm in China with over $2.5 billion in assets under management. His new book, AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future, helps us understand the promise and peril of that technology over the next two decades. It will disrupt uh, healthcare, uh, improve education, and pretty much um, impact, disrupt, or enable every imaginable industry. On this episode of Influencers, Kai Fu joined me to talk about the jobs that robots will replace, the way AI factors into plans for the so-called metaverse, and what it means for winners and losers in the tech industry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Kai-Fu Lee, CEO of Sinovation Ventures, former president of Google China and author of the new book, AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future. Kai-Fu, welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. So I want to ask you about your book, uh, which uses fiction to explore how AI will transform society, not in some far off time, but over the next 20 years. Why did you use fiction and why such a relatively short time window? Uh -huh. uh, because AI is such an important technology that I think everyone should uh, try to understand it. But yet it sounds uh, kind of rocket science to some people and um, it's very hard to understand. I wanted to make it the most accessible and, and even entertaining. So I have a co-author who is a well-known science fiction writer, uh, Chen Xiufan, and uh, he wrote the stories based on my roadmap of what technologies uh, will mature in the tw next 20 year time frame. So how significant will the impact of AI be over the next two decades and in what specific ways? It's quite significant. 20 years is actually a, quite a long period of time. Think about 20 years ago, right? Uh, if I went back in time to show the, the, the world we have today, you know, with uh, iPhone and apps and uh, Netflix and Zoom, none of these existed back then. Uh, it would be almost like um, science fiction. And, and that's, and I think going to the future, things will change even more uh, because AI is now gaining many aspects of intelligence, able to converse with us, able to uh, understand uh, text, language, and images and video and autonomous vehicles and robots will work. It will disrupt uh, healthcare, uh, improve education, and pretty much um, impact, disrupt, or enable every imaginable industry. Uh, so quite, uh, quite a large amount of change, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about some, maybe some even more specific examples coming up, but I, I first I gotta ask you about the pandemic and has this yeah. influenced the trajectory of AI? I think it accelerated AI a little, um, partly because you know people work from home and workload is being uh, digitized, and then uh, AI can take over or improve parts of that work, and we're already seeing that. Um, and also partly because of social distancing, uh, ro robotics is improving at a faster speed. Uh, for example, COVID tests in China are done by robots. So it's a hundred times faster than people. And um, such robots can also be used in drug discovery and growing organoids. Um, and this is not 2041, this is 2021. So it's accelerated robotics um, as well. Kaifu, let me ask you a really fundamental question. What is AI? AI is generally considered um, the study of intelligence and the use of technologies uh, that perform tasks that could only be done with um, in, quote unquote intelligence. Um, so that's the general field. And then within AI, there is a subfield called machine learning and sometimes called deep learning, which is one 
aspect of machine learning, which is specifically has to do with developing uh, software te technologies using data to um, learn some um, tasks that requires intelligence. So it's a data-driven way to deliver the appearance of intelligence. And, and, and currently, AI, machine learning, deep learning are sometimes used interchangeably. So I wanted to, to clarify that. And so an example would be a machine that performs a task, but then learns from the task and improves its functionality? Yes, uh, from data. And it's important to note that uh, the human programmer does not program every logic into that AI. The human programmer says, go learn this. And then AI takes all the data and learns from it. Um, it goes all the way from very simple examples like Facebook watches, um, what you click and what you buy and what you watch, and then decides what content to target you so that you watch the most content and stay on Facebook. Uh, all the way up to an autonomous vehicle uh, watches the road and knows where you want to get to, plans the route, um, avoids hitting a pedestrian, and gets you there as quickly as possible uh, and also safely. So, so that, I think, is the range of what AI can do today. Another one that I love, of course, is the music streaming services that learn your tastes and then serve right. you more and more choices that delight you if it works, right? Right, right. So uh, the more it knows about you, the better it does. So if a music service um, knows other people like you, knows what you have liked, and, and what you liked is indicated by what you listen to a lot, but also what you don't listen to uh, and what you listen to and then uh, stop. So it's learning all that as it watches you. And, and uh, if a service actually knows other aspects about you, then it can become even more intelligent. You know, one of the stories in the book is a super app that was developed by an insurance company, which also develops um, many other applications like social applications, dating applications, e-commerce, coupons. And then it collects all the patterns about someone and it does such a good job minimizing your insurance, improving your health. But the interesting thing in the story is while it optimizes all these good things for you, it also um, unintentionally does something bad. In the story, it interferes with um, uh, the, the, the main character's love life because the person that she was dating is believed to be dragging down her um, uh, social status and uh, health. And, and that relates to a racial issue that, and the story takes place in India, where the caste system was, is already basically gone, but there are still remnants that the AI can pick up when it knows too much about you. Yeah, so you talk about those negative consequences that people are concerned about. And of course, they, they see, you know, the, the movies where the robots take over and there's a million, a million movies like that. But so how realistic is it to be concerned about these potential consequences? Yeah, the one thing that most people are most concerned about won't happen, <laughs> but there are many other concerns people should have. The dystopian scenario where the robots take over presumes that AI has self-awareness and emotion and desire and intentionality, and it doesn't have any of that. AI is today is a giant optimizer. Human says, go optimize this, and it takes all the data and optimizes what the human tells it to optimize. And, and it doesn't have any desire or belief. If you shut the program off, if you unplug the computer, it's gone. Um, so, so that belief that it has a um, intention, desire, and, and bad motives uh, is simply uh, not true and probably won't be developed or developable. We don't even know how to develop it. We don't know how the human brain works and why we have self-awareness and, and the desires and emotions. So it's going to, it, it may happen one day, but uh, certainly uh, very, very unlikely in the next 20 years. So with negative consequences, again, going back to the music example, which is maybe very mundane, but it would negate serendipity the chances of me just discovering something 
that is completely unrelated to my previous listening patterns that might in fact be something I want to hear? Is that a potential mm. consequence, for instance? Uh, that, that's possible, um, but there can be clever AI, right? So if, if a higher level AI learns that you uh, as someone like serendipity, uh, because you really enjoyed reading something out of the blue that didn't match what you want, it could then infer you might want that in music mm -hmm. and it might try to find what, um, what that might be. What we regard as serendipity might actually be predictable. So, um, so I think that would be possibly solvable and, and certainly not the worst um, outcome of uh, AI. Okay, well, so there gotta be some concerns that yeah. are uh, you know, potentially serious. What, what might those be? Okay, so in the book, there is uh, one set that we call externalities. Externalities happens when AI is told to do something and it's so good at doing that thing that it forgets uh, or actually ignores other externalities or negative impacts that it may cause. So when YouTube keeps sending us videos that we're most likely to click on, it's not only not thinking about serendipity, it's also potentially sending me um, very negative views or very one-sided views that might shape my thinking. So that would be one form of externality that is unintentional consequence on the user because it maniacally tries to optimize something else. Um, another is uh, the, the personal data, uh, when, if that's possibly compromised. Uh, another is bias and fairness. Another is, can AI explain to us why it made decisions that it made for key things like um, driving, uh, autonomous vehicles, the trolley problem, medical uh, decision-making, surgeries? It, it gets serious. But the single largest danger, as I describe in the book, um, is autonomous weapons. And that's when AI can be, uh, can be trained to kill and more specifically trained to assassinate. Uh, imagine a drone that can fly itself and, and seek uh, specific people uh, out, either with facial recognition or cell signals or whatever, and then it has a bullet, a small piece of dynamite that it can shoot uh, point blank at a person's forehead. And you know how fast drones move. So the, the danger uh, is that this uh, targeted assassination weapon can be built by an experienced hobbyist for $1,000. And I think that changes the future of um, terrorism because no longer are terrorists uh, potentially losing their lives to do something bad. It also allows a terrorist group to um, use 10,000 of these drones to perform something as terrible as genocide. And of course, it changes the future of warfare because between country and country, this can create havoc and damage, but perhaps anonymously, and people don't know who did the attack. So it's also quite different from nuclear arms race, where nuclear arms race at least has deterrence built in, that you don't attack someone for the fear of retaliation and annihilation. But uh, autonomous weapons um, might be uh, doable as a surprise attack, and people might not even know who did it. So I think that is a, from my perspective, the ultimate greatest danger that AI can be a part of, and we need to be cautious and figure out how to ban or regulate it. Yeah, that is scary. And I think I've read uh, an article about that fairly recently, about the future of warfare is terrifying, and it described various weapons and scenarios where these weapons were used. So just to drill down on that just a little bit, how would we uh, prevent these types of um, weapons to be deployed or developed even? Um, so one, one uh, example is to look at history, um, how uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons were banned. Um, there could be a global treaty that is enforced. Uh, there are, if they're drones, today the easiest way, uh, the cheapest ways to build a drone, not a robot. Robots are much more expensive and more clumsy and harder to control. Drones are the most dangerous. So perhaps having some uh, stronger laws of, of the air on um, uh, how, where and how drones can be deployed, and perhaps having some defensive mechanisms that uh, prevent, you know, where there are a lot of people or a lot of um, 
government uh, functions uh, to have defensive functions that would basically shoot down drones in areas that aren't permitted. So I'm not an expert in the domain, but just to brainstorm, these are some ideas. I'm sure there are other better ideas. Some of the other problems you talked about sounded like very close to the problems that the big social media companies in the United States um, are already uh, running into uh, in terms of privacy or in terms of sending uh, an abundance of negative signals uh, unintentionally, perhaps even. So I, I want to ask you about the big tech companies. Will AI offer a meaningful avenue of disruption um, or is it just another development that big companies will co-opt and take hold of? I think there will be uh, giants developing in many domains. I don't think the current internet companies will easily move across domains. So the most likely outcome, if unchecked, is that the internet companies, social media companies, will grow ever more powerful in their domains. And probably antitrust will prevent them from going across domains. And also other domains are tricky and different. Uh, but, but most likely there will be other giants that emerge, uh, giants in healthcare, in insurance, giants in transportation and automotive, giants in robotic manufacturing. So I think this is truly a disruptive force that will enable every industry to have new giants that emerge. Um, just the natural uh, course of technology development is to have large companies that build platforms that are at the same time beneficial because it allows an industry to be reborn, but also dangerous because of too much power they have. And with the power of data, that they're gathering data from the users and they know a lot about individuals. And this data makes their AI and technology work better than other companies, thereby allowing them to um, uh, extend the longevity of their monopoly. So it's both a great thing, but also a dangerous thing. When you talk about crossing domains, it sounds to me a little bit like the metaverse. And I'm wondering, um, how AI and the metaverse are connected, or if they are at all, in fact? Absolutely. I think, you know, in the, in the metaverse, there will be um, other beings, and um, uh, there will be people who are themselves, but there will also be other beings, um, you know, uh, pets and uh, aliens and games and other people. And, and I think it, it's a lot more interesting and fun if there are a mixture of uh, real people and, um, um, and virtual people. So I think AI will be a part of that. And then the, the, in, a, in a truly natural metaverse, we will be conversing uh, using our language and our body language. And, um, and AI can, of course, provide an ability to, to understand that. Uh, and in the metaverse, uh, here's a, a tricky and maybe a little bit scary question is, well, the, the programmer of the metaverse, the company that builds the metaverse, will actually listen in on every conversation and watch every person. And that, on the one hand, can make the experience very exciting because it can see what makes you happy and give you more of that. But then uh, what is the notion of privacy in the metaverse? So I think a lot of uh, excitement, I think, uh, in combining these two technologies. You recently said, quote, AI will disrupt every imaginable industry. Why will its effects be so pervasive and will it really touch all facets of our lives, do you think? Uh, because this ability to um, essentially deliver human intelligence um, just by merely observing data and the power of uh, when you have the more data you have, the more powerful AI gets. These properties make it uh, all encompassing. So let's take healthcare as an example. Um, AI can take so much more of our data and consider it to, in order to make us healthy, help us live longer and treat our illnesses. 
This data includes our family history, our health records, our uh, wearables, right? our blood pressure on a 24 by 7 basis, and also um, all of our imaging radiology reports and our genetic sequencing uh, multi-omics uh, output, and of course, blood tests. So with all of this combined, feeding into an AI, it can make a much more accurate and precise diagnosis uh, when we're ill, but also give us health hints on how to, how to make us more healthier. Just as an example, I am using uh, a AI longevity software. Uh, along with a professional doctor who interprets the output. And, all, and I am measuring all those things that I mentioned to you. And in the past year, my, um, my, the, the level of um, um, my, all of my data shows that I am now six, younger, six years younger than I was one year ago. So the advice that it's being able to give me has helped given me great advice about how my lifestyle as well as um, uh, nutrients and, uh, and, and medicines to take. And, and this is just the very beginning. And also AI will help people discover more drugs at one tenth the cost. Um, rare diseases will become treatable and um, uh, AI will uh, be able to help monitor older people and keep them uh, healthy and um, uh, uh, and watch when if they have a fall or or didn't take their medicine. So 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 I think the entire healthcare industry will change, mm -hmm. and and people will not only live longer but but healthier. So that's just one example in one industry. I want to ask you a little bit about economic implications, Kai Fu, because you said that AI will lead to a world in which some tycoons will make a lot of money while jobs will be lost. Why could AI exacerbate wealth inequality? And, and what can we do about that? Yes, I mean, we, we can just already see all the internet companies. Um, I think without AI, they, they'd probably be only worth half of what they're worth because AIs help them monetize. And that will uh, extend into all the other industries. So the tycoons, there will, so will, be, there will be more numerous and they will be even richer and richer. At the same time, because AI is um, developing human intelligence equivalents, and that means AI can do many of the tasks and jobs that we do today. And in particular, AI will first do jobs that are routine. So uh, white collar jobs like telemarketing and customer service and um, uh, people who copy and paste and file expense reports. Uh, desk jobs, those will be gone first because AI can do them just in software. You don't even need robotics. And then um, a blue collar work, visual inspection, uh, assembly line work, um, uh, many waiters and waitresses and um, uh, many of the, uh, the jobs in factories and warehouses, the pickers in, at Amazon, the cashiers, at grocery store. Um, and of course, in about 15, 20 years, all the drivers, all the people who drive for a living. So when you add all that up, it's a substantial number of jobs. And when, when it's simultaneously making a small number of people ultra rich and making many people jobless, that is the wealth inequality um, problem that AI will uh, exacerbate. I mean, it sounds like the only jobs left are going to be the people who program and code AI. I mean, I know that's an exaggeration, but is it is it probably the case that AI will be a net job killer or would it possibly be a net job creator? I think ultimately it will be a net job creator uh, as every technology has been. Uh, but I think the next 20 years, it will take away more jobs than it creates. But in... But over time, it will create many jobs. Think about the internet, right? It's you know created many jobs that we did not think it would. Twenty years ago, we, I could no, none of us could have predicted uh, Uber drivers would be an uh, interesting new and a sizable profession, and and AI will do similar things. Also, there are many things that AI can cannot do in twenty years or maybe even longer. It won't have creativity. Um, when I say that it has human level intelligence, I meant for a simple routine, one domain at a time things like driving, like answering a call. It does not 
have the general uh, analytical creative capabilities that we have, uh, nor does AI have any self-awareness, emotion, com compassion, empathy, or the um, ability to win trust from other people. So there will be also many service type of jobs that has to do with human connection and trust. Uh, for example, healthcare services uh, that uh, I think will see more jobs emerging. So ultimately, I think you know we'll figure this out. There will be new professions created. There will be more creative and uh, service level jobs. Uh, but uh, there will be a challenging period when in which um, job job destruction is larger than job creation. With all this change and all these implications. A huge question, what role should governments play in regulating AI? Well, AI clearly has to be regulated. Um, there are just so many things that can go wrong uh, with AI companies and engineers that don't take care. And um, for example, protecting uh, personal data of individuals, for example, uh, ensuring that there is not built-in inherent bias or unfairness. Um, and and, and the, the new ways need, need to be developed to regulate uh, internet companies and also future holders of big data. This is happening throughout the world. I think it um, can be a couple of things that will uh, be developed further. One, I think, is just um, a very a serious punishment for companies that uh, compromise personal data in some very bad way, like selling it uh, to, to people that um, without the user's consent, um, like the Facebook Cambridge Analytica situation. Um, another, I think, idea that I find very interesting is AI audit, because it's so expensive and challenging to go um, you know, lift the hood under some company's AI and see what went wrong, like fairness issues. Uh, I think we might think of uh, AI audits like we think of financial audits. Um, you know, IRS audits a tiny percentage of the people, but it's a strong deterrence for people not to evade taxes. So if um, uh, there is a similar process of how maybe when the company gets too many complaints, um, it gets audited and then it needs to comply in fairness and other aspects. So this, all this has to be worked out. Uh, I, I really don't think the current general thinking of um, looking at a big internet company and it's abusing data, so let's break it up into several companies. That I think is too brute force and it's too you know, 19th century. The, we're, we're, we're not in the 19th century uh, dealing with you know, old issues of standard oil and, and, and things like that anymore, or the 20th century with AT&T. Uh, this is uh, something that needs a uh, finer grain uh, uh, and, and something that really helps push companies to be in greater alignment with what users want. And, and more delicate approaches are needed than just brute force breaking companies up. Interesting. You've argued in recent years that China has taken the lead over the US in the development of AI. Do you still feel that China is a better home for innovation in this area? And if so, what does the US need to do to catch up? Yeah, in my previous book, uh, AI Superpowers, I talked about the rise of Chinese AI, which I think is um, uh, proving to be true. Um, I, I don't think I quite stated that China is taking over from the US. Each country has uh, companies that are strong in different aspects. I think um, you know Chinese companies are pushing forward, uh, for example, robotics, because China is strong in manufacturing. Uh, in the US, AI companies are pushing forward enterprise AI. Companies like uh, Palantir, C3 AI are leading the world. So I think there are strong examples in both countries. And academic research is also quite strong uh, in, in, in both countries. Um, so so my, my day job is um, uh, venture capital investor. So in the last three years, we've invested in a lot of robotic companies uh, that build um, uh, robots and uh, smart technologies uh, for factories and that basically take over some work from the people, but reducing the costs. I think that is a driver uh, because China is the factory of the 
of the world, and automation and robotics is the best way to reduce the cost of manufacturing. So, so that's something uh, I believe in, not only in my books, but in my day job. Kaifu, I want to change gears here a little bit and ask you about you, because um, mm -hmm. you have such an interesting uh, uh, career. For instance, decades ago, your research was central to the development of speech recognition and automated speech technology. Did you ever imagine that that technology would come this far in such a short time? Yes, I wrote my PhD thesis in 1988. And uh, actually, to tell you the truth, at the time, I thought speech would become pervasive. Um, certainly by the year 2000. And I was too much of an optimist because things that work in the laboratory actually has a lot of um, um, fragility that will ultimately get uh, fixed with um, being put in the market and getting feedback from the user. So, um, but, but, um, but I think we finally reached that moment. This was the moment that I had dreamed that AI would uh, take off and it would um, liberate uh, humans from uh, routine work, and it would be would have a certain level of intelligence that becomes our uh, companion and it does things that we don't want to do. So this is all my dreams come true, uh, um, but honestly, <laughs> later than I thought, but uh, it's great. I'm still able to catch it um, at a maybe tail end of my career, but able to catch it nevertheless. Now, speaking of your career, I mean, it's remarkable that you worked at Apple and Microsoft and Google in the 1990s and 2000s. What were some of the differences in how those companies approach, say, technological innovation? Yeah, that's a great question. I I'm learned so much from these three companies and I now strongly believe that companies have their DNA and they need to stay strong with their DNA to be the best they can be. And it's hard to shift into some way that it's not. For example, Apple at Apple, I learned about uh, being just incredibly focused on the user and building things that wow people. Um, and, and it's a double-edged sword. That's why I build great products and that's why they're pretty expensive. Um, at Microsoft, I learned that a gigantic team can work together um, and, and build um, you know, a, a unbelievably large product like Windows. Uh, teams of tens of thousands of people were actually able to get organized and build software that work interconnectedly. Um, and the process in developing this gigantic monolithic software is uh, a, a real marvel. I learned so much from, from Microsoft. And, and I think Google is more the believer that small teams of incredibly smart people can outdo large organizations and that internet uh, changes everything. And that's what I, I learned at Google, the fact that you know, small projects from uh, Google Maps and Gmail and, and all the way to Google Brain and some of the AI efforts were just a handful of people who can make so much difference because they're so smart. And um, uh, it's a, it's a non-hierarchical organization and, and people can all have brilliant ideas and there's minimal uh, hierarchy and uh, bureaucracy. So, so I learned so much from each one and, and each company has uh, done great things uh, since I left, but continuing to do the best they can when they focus on uh, the parts of the DNA that uh, is their essence and their strength. And last question, Kai Fu, what legacy do you want to leave behind? Uh, I like to be remembered as someone who has played a small role to make complex technologies usable by everyone. Short and sweet, but a lot of depth behind that, no doubt. Kai Fu Lee, CEO of Sinovation Ventures, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thanks for having me. You've been watching Influencers, I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.